Hi, welcome to the Games Planner. I'm Jeff the Games Planner, and today I'm Games Planning 2017. So, if you have followed my Instagram or Twitter account, you will know that I've been tracking how many games I've played this year. Uh, it's time for me to do a top 10 list. Many people on my Facebook have asked for it because I link my Instagram, Twitter to Facebook. So every single one of my Facebook friends has been pummeled with pictures of games this year. To my Facebook friends who are bored with it, sorry. I don't know if it's going to continue. We'll see what next year has. I'm doing a top 10 list of my favourite games of what I have played over 2017. The date right now is the 1st of January, so I've included everything that I've played, including game I've, um, games I played last night. I still had one that I got to the table for the first time last night, and it was really good, but I'll get to that at a later stage. Now, I'm going to put a caveat. That one, it's not able to be in this list. I played 600 games but there's 210 unique games within that. And then on top of that, I've taken out everything that I only played once. Uh, anything I've played once probably hasn't had enough plays for me to have, be able to make a really good informed decision on it. Uh, and that one play was either last night or many, many months ago, so possibly forgotten. So there's a lot of games that might be really good, but I've ignored them because they only got played once this year. Which means I have that... 210 games whittled down to 117 games that had more than one play. Uh, on top of that, I have knocked out about another 10 games that had more than 10 plays. Uh, those are all games that are party games or social deduction games or games that last 10 minutes. So they're going to get a heap of plays. And I thought, you know what? I don't really want to include them. I don't think any of them would make the top 10 list. There's one exception to that. and I'm going to make it an honourable mention right now. Fuse. This is my most played game for 2017. We played it 29 times. Now, it runs for 10 minutes. I have played probably half of those plays in the last week or so. Um, not just to get my numbers up for how many games I've played for this year, but because we kept losing. It's really hard. We kept losing, we kept losing, we put it down to the easiest level and we still lost and we still lost and then suddenly we won so we started pushing it back up again and winning some, losing some. Um, we managed to beat the second hardest level. We did not win against the hardest level yet. Uh, Fuse, fabulous game. So if you haven't watched my video or be aware of this one, it's a dice rolling game. It runs for 10 minutes. There's a soundtrack that goes with it and we, you're trying to defuse a bomb by making combinations out of your dice and there's different colored dice and they've got numbers on them and you'll do um, whenever you, you've got to work together with everyone else at the table to decide which of the dice that are being rolled are going to be used by each player so two players might need the same die it's up to you guys to work out really quickly who's going to get it if you spend too long umming and ahhing over it you're not no one's going to get it everyone's going to lose the other one that I want to give an honorable mention to is right here, Magic Maze. That had a whole bunch of plays as well. Not as good as Fuse, but you can have a look at my games plays for those and game play, um, game explanations for both of those games to get more information on them. I put a little link, uh, there'll be a little eye, I can't remember if it's this side or this side, one of those two sides, um, that will link you back to the video, the original video of when I did my game explanation for each game as we go through. So please, if you wish to have a closer look at one of the games, click on the link. I have learnt quite a few things about myself and about my gaming preferences through my adventures in gaming this year. Other than the fact I actually really like social deduction games, I like party games that have a heap of people. My absolute favourite thing is to have a table full of people and have a game that everyone can be playing. So things like Resistance and um, Wits and Wages, that's a really good one. Um, they come out a lot. Uh, Wits and Wages not so much because I've only just had it for the last month or so, but um, resistance especially. If I've got a table of 10 people or more, that's probably going to be my go-to for bringing a game to people. Um, Magic Maze will play up to 8, so you know, if we get that 8 people around a table, Magic Maze will come out. Um, games like that, I really love them. They're short, they're quick, and every time I've played them with non-gamers, they've loved it and they've wanted to play more games. And I think they're one of the best ways to get people who aren't gamers into playing because what it's about is that social atmosphere of everyone sitting around the table and trying to work on something together. It's a really, really good thing and um, for people to get involved in. So I've put all them aside, but I really enjoy those games. Other than that, I have realized that a majority of my top 10 list is worker placement games. I really like worker placement games. The other thing I've noticed is that the weight of my top 10 list, uh, it I haven't checked against Board Game Geek, but it almost goes from the lightest weight through to the heaviest weight games that I own as 
getting up to my number one game. You may already be able to guess what my number one game is if you've been watching my videos um, for the even for the last three or four months. You may even be able to guess what what my number one game is for this year. But let's put that aside. We'll get to that eventually. Other things I've realised is I, I have grown as a gamer through this year. My wife has grown as a gamer this year. Um, my wife used to kind of get a game and go, oh, there's too much going on here, and her her number one game and my number one game are the same game. Um, so we'll get once again we'll get to that we'll get to it. Ah, um, ah, okay, that's fine. You can jump ahead if you really need to, but that's that's all good. Let's get into it, and I'll talk about each game as I go through and and give you some opinions. I have done a game simulation video for every single one of these games. Okay, so without further ado, my number ten game out of all the games I've played this year is Aquaspeed. I have discovered that I am a big fan of Stefan Feld's games. Aquasphere is a Stefan Feld game. This is not a Stefan Feld game like all of the others. I expect in a Stefan Feld game to have a Moncola um, and or a Rondel um, as, as one of the basic mechanisms. There's kind of a Rondel-ish idea in it, but it's not. This game is worker placement, but it's got a lot of different levels to it. Uh, there's only a handful of things that happen in in each round, and it's four rounds total. So, the this game, it only plays with four players. It's just a really lovely, different approach to the worker placement mechanisms. The board, it's got that one thing that I really love about a game, it's got table presence. When you look at a picture of it, there's just stuff everywhere. Um, there's three boards that everyone's contending with, including your own board. So, I've got my board, if I've got four players, there's four of them, then there's another two boards on top of that, and each of those boards affect each other. I really love stuff like that. I really love when there's a lot going on, and you've got to keep track of multiple things. Um, within your placements, there's, I mean, it's not even work, it is worker placement, but it's, it's action selection worker placements, probably a better way to put it. So, you're selecting what actions you're going to be able to do, so you're programming a, a, a bot or a robot, and then you're actioning that robot. But in order to action that robot, you've got to get your guy to the right spot. Uh, and you can bump people out of those spots, it doesn't affect what they're doing. So theoretically, this could play as one player, but you're, there, there is a certain element of keeping track of what the other person's doing to be able to stay on top of them, because sometimes you're getting points for having the most of something, and sometimes you're getting points for the number of things you've got, and quite often with this game, um, more often than not, in fact, the number of things you've got is, it, 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 it magnifies your points, so if you've got one of them, you're getting one point, if you've got two, you're getting three points, if, you're getting, if you've got three of them, you're getting nine points, it just, it's got that growth thing to it, so you can work towards getting really large points out of one action, um, that's the type of stuff I really like. So, Aquasphere, um, Taste Mistral game, check it out, really good game, that's my number 10 play for the year. My number 9 game for the year is not a worker placement. My number 9 game for the year is a cooperative game, it is a deck building game. I have quite a few deck builders, I have said before that I'm not the hugest fan of deck builders, with the exception of a couple of games. This is obviously one of them. I have said before that co-op games, I'm still not sure where they land. I started the year thinking I don't really like co-ops. I started the year going into it with experiences from things like Forbidden Desert and games like that where you're, you're, you're co-oping together but it's it gets quarterbacked quite often. Um, with games that I own that I know and I'm playing co-op with, I tend to quarterback and that's something that I have stated that I need to work on and I'm going to continue to work on to get over the top of. Um, with this game, there's very little quarterbacking. Yes, it's possible to quarterback, but I don't. So, what is it? My number nine game for the year is Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. We played through all of the different games within this box, and we got beaten once only. I've got since got the expansion, the More Monsters expansion, and I haven't beaten it yet. <laughs> um, the It's a good game. It's a really wonderful game. It's got some good story to it. It's on an IP that I really know and love. And even though IP games um, tend to turn me off, this one, not so much. There's some really good elements. It, when you think that you know how to get through this game, and look, it's possible to get to that way and kind of find a path that is most likely to get you there. You're not always going to get there because of the randomness of the events and the cards. I what find that we get pummeled by the Dark Arts events cards. They will quite often change. If we're hitting one, it's fine. If we're hitting three, 
then we get into trouble because one of those three is more than likely to have a little note at the bottom of it saying and draw another Dark Arts events card. And so you get pummeled and pummeled and pummeled with it. Uh, I really love that. It makes it such a hard game to get through. Um, with co-op games, I think there's a really fine line between too easy and too hard. If it's too hard and you never get through it, you don't want to play it again because you know the outcome. If it's too easy and you're getting through it every time, same problem. You tend to not want to play it because it's not challenging and you know the outcome before you even play it. So, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle, I think it, it is probably one of the... It is, well, for my money, is the better of the uh, deck building card games. And it's the best of the co-op games that I've been playing. So, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle, let's keep moving. Number eight is Istanbul. Istanbul um, is... You're placing the cards around the table in a grid pattern. It's going to be different. Every time you play it, it'll be different. Um, especially, well, if you go with the randomised selection of where those cards are. Which means that your track for how you get to everything is going to be different. If you play the same board every time, you'll get bored with this game very quickly. Because what you're looking for is the quickest track to get to what you need. For the most rubies to come through. To be able to gain all those rubies. Once you find that path, you can just keep completely keep repeating that path and you'll get it. But if you've got a board that's different each time, which this is because it's on tiles, we end up with having to rethink what's the best way to get from place A to place B. The beautiful thing about this game is that when you choose a space, you leave a marker there, or a worker or an assistant, and you leave markers wherever you go. So you're building this track of these markers. Once you run out of those markers, you then have to go back over the places you've been to pick them back up. And so, not just thinking about where do I want to go, but also thinking about what am I likely to want to do again is really important in this game. So, um, running, your, running through the game and kind of thinking ahead with that is really important. What I found more often than not, not always, but more often than not, is everyone's been within one or two rubies of the final round or finishing the game when the game finishes. So it's super tight, no matter which directions you go, it's actually a really well-balanced game. I really, really appreciate this game. It's a two to five player game, so it plays that extra player. Um, I haven't played with five players, so I can't say if that slows the game down, but it feels like it runs fairly quickly, so I imagine it doesn't, and I look forward to trying it out with five players. Um, I've got the expansions in here. Once again, I haven't actually played with the expansions yet. Uh, I've said this before, I said it in the game explanation. There's two expansions from memory in this box. I haven't felt the need to pull either of them out yet. Uh, I will get to that eventually, but um, look forward to doing that. Uh, Istanbul, that's number eight. Okay, number seven. Number seven is a, a game that's really near and dear to my heart. It's one of the earliest worker placement games I've got. It's one of the games that got me into gaming. I've said this before, I said it in the videos. So without further ado, Kalis, two to five player game, worker placement. What I really love about this one is that you're paying to put your workers out and then you're going to gain things. And you've got to think about what order you're going to gain the things so you can't kind of activate the buildings in a certain order in accordance to a path. And so you, if you can get some resources back here, you can use those resources here. I really love that because you've got to think through the entire turn. Not just look at what's in your hand to what can I do, but go what's in my hand and what am I going to get by the time I need to need that resource. Um, that's what I really love about this game. Really worthwhile looking into. If you can get a copy of it, I really heavily suggest getting this game. It is one of the strongest games that I own. <laughs> it is my number seven game for this year. Let's keep moving. Number six. Number six, unfortunately, is a game that is out of print. So if you are able to find a copy of it, do it. My number six game is Russian Railroads. Russian Railroads is the first of the games that had a feeling of uh, so much tension as it got to the end that I was on my feet when playing it. I, out of my chair going, oh, what's going to happen? What can I do? Can I manipulate this to get these, all these points at the end? Um, it's such a slow starting game that you're only getting one or two, maybe five points in the first round. But by the time you get towards those last few rounds, you're going to be pulling in 50 points at a time. The problem is, the one or two at the beginning, that's actually what wins and loses the game. It's a really, really tight worker placement game. Uh, it's just so much tension to There's it. a number of paths to victory, and all of them are really well balanced and work. So there's, there's not like you're going to land on one of those paths and go, this is how I'm going to win the game every time. It'll be different. So um, it's a worthwhile game to look at. I love it, I love it, love it, love it. And it's really, really, really tight. Russian Railroad. Now, what would a worker placement list be? <laughs> it's not officially a worker placement list, but it's turning into one, isn't it? Um, a worker placement list be without 
going into some of my favourite designers. In fact, four out of the last five games are from two designers. The first one is Jamie Stegmaier, Stonemaier Games, Viticulture. I am so in love with this game. Viticulture, it plays to a six player player count. I have played it with six. It doesn't go too slow for it to still work. This has some really good worker placement in it because there's an ability for more than one player to go to each spot, depending on how many players you're playing with. If you're playing with two, then only one player can go to each spot. If you're playing with all six, three players can go to each spot. There's a bonus for the first person to get onto each spot. But on top of that, there's this grande worker. Uh, in fact, sorry, I'll just step in right now and say, if you look back at my videos, I think I was calling it the grand worker and someone pulled me up on my pronunciation. I'm sorry about that. Grande, big, the big guy. So when you send your grande worker to a place, if it's already full, so you've got three workers on that spot, you can still go there and action that spot, even if your guys are the ones who are filled up. So it's possible in a six player game, if you, get there and no one else wants those spots, it's actually possible to do the same thing four times, theoretically, if you really wanted to. The other beautiful thing of this game is that concept of having to build buildings to get extra bonuses, plus having to go to a spot to get more workers. And as we know, in every worker placement game, the more workers you have, the better. So if you're able to use that grand A worker, um, and if no one else is wanting to do workers in one turn, it's possible for you to actually get quite a few extra workers in the same turn if you've got enough money to do it. Viticulture. Uh, the Tuscan expansion is also worthwhile checking out. I've played with that. I like both versions. Uh, it's worthwhile trying out and playing both versions. I think I'll jump between the two depending on how I'm feeling at the time. So really worthwhile. Viticulture. Love it. The next one, my number four game, is another Jamie Stegmaier. And what would this list be without Scythe? This seems to be one of the hottest games for the last couple of years. Um, the second expansion, uh, Wind Gambit, has just come out um, a month or two back this year. I've got it, I haven't played with that yet. I have played this game with six players. It plays up to seven when you've got the expansion on it, or first expansion on it. I've played with six, it plays fine. It's a little bit too much downtime. I fear that seven players would be a little bit too much downtime again, but that is because I'm playing with players who aren't necessarily all over this game. I think if I played with seven players who all knew the game really well, it would run fairly quickly. The reason this game is so good and runs so quickly is because you have one action, choice of four, the one you're standing on, you can't choose again, so it's choice of three. When you do that action, it's a really quick, I'm going to move, move you guys, Next person starts while you go to your bottom row action, which is gaining extra stuff and making decisions. So all of your thinkiness or a lot of your thinkiness happens at the bottom of your board and you can be doing that while the next person's going. In fact, quite often I've been playing a game where I'm just finishing and my bottom part and I look up and there's only one more player who has to go before it's my turn again. And so the game actually runs through very quickly. I like that it plays with a larger player count. It is a little bit of a steep learning curve for the first play, um, but in the rules, in the way it's explained, it says play the game to learn it. And that's my best advice with this. It's a worker placement game with the ability to have some attackiness on other players. And that is a whole other element to, to this game, to games and Euro games, and, the, and it works really well. The attackiness on this isn't really attacky, and so you feel okay about doing it most of the time. Um, Scythe, I've played this quite a lot this year. It's a worthwhile game. If you haven't tried it, give it a go. That's my number four game for the year. Now, we start getting into the into the heavy games. All the rest of the games are rated above four as a heaviness rating on Board Game Geek. So, my number three game for the year. This is probably my wife's number one or number two. Um, she actually pushed it a little bit higher in the list than I was going to put it, but that's okay because I'm, I'm really in love with this game. It doesn't get to the table enough because it takes six hours with two of us. Six hours, and we want to play it again. The first time we played this game, in fact, I'll tell you what it is, then I'll get into that. My number three game for this year is The Colonist. The Colonist lasts for six hours with a two player, as a two-player experience. It has four eras. You could cut it down and just play one or two of those eras if you want to play a shorter game. Uh, I reckon it takes about 45 minutes per player per era, is what I've mathed it out to be. Uh, if you're not thinking much, obviously it goes quicker, but there's a lot of thinking in it. The tile placement and building of the board or play area is really important and that almost becomes a co-op experience because we tend to find that the other players will 
have their input into it going, no, don't put that there, we're going to struggle to get things if you put it there. If you put it here, it'll be easier to get to it because we need that tile to give us the resource to be able to build that tile. You have to, you have to do whatever the tile says whenever you move on to it. I love that. It forces you into directions and patterns for your trail that um, you wouldn't necessarily take any other time. But because you have to do it, you might find you go a longer way to get to the tile you actually want to get to. This game, we played it the first time. The next morning, my wife woke up saying, hey, can we play that game again? Every time we've got a day where there's a, where we've got a day to just sit and game, almost always the first call is, hey, can we play the colonists? It is such a good, good, good tile laying, city building game that... And there's just, oh, there's so many decisions in it and so much going on for it. What I found, um, it's a little bit of a, it's not a huge point salad, but it's a little bit of a point salad when you get to the end. But what I found is that the scores kind of were here the first time we played and then they were here and here and here and here. Every time we played, we, the scores have got better because we're able to manipulate that board more. Um, I'm, <laughs> I hate to say this, but I really, really want the colonists to grow. Um, I want a fifth era. So, people at Mayfair Games, um, if you're listening, please, can you do an expansion for this? Give me a fifth era, a sixth era. I want to keep growing this game. I want it to go for eight hours, for 12 hours. <laughs> I, I don't know why. It, it, I can be playing this game for six hours and get to the end and, and go, where did my day go? I don't feel like I've sat there for six hours. My wife, who has said she doesn't have a great attention span, can get to the end of the six hours and go, oh, is it done? Oh, where'd the time go? It doesn't lose that attention. I'm not sure what it is about this game. Um, I, it's such a solid, solid game. So if you've got the time, if you think you're ever going to have the time, I would strongly suggest having a look into the colonists. It's my number three game for the year. Okay, down to my number two. You're probably going to be able to get the guess whose these are and what they are. So, my number two game is The Gallerist by Vita Lasada, put out by Eagle Griffin Games. It is a one to four player experience. I have played it with four players, it works beautifully. I've played it with two players, it works beautifully. The decision in this game, there, it seems on the surface when you break it down, it seems there's not much decision. There's four locations you can go to, just like with the other work placements, you have to move. So it only gives you three choices. Within those three choices, when you choose your location, you have two choices. That's it. But what this game is about is the economic flow. It's about finding that way to get a cash flow to allow things to happen. I tried this game working cahoots with another player uh, to help both of ourselves out. She absolutely wiped the floor with me by doing that. I need to not do that again. Um, but you've got that ability to negotiate with the other players to go, okay, we both own art from this one artist. How about we use our resources to push that one artist up so that we can get streaks ahead? Um, that's a really good thing to do it can backfire, which it did. I've lost this game more than I've won this game. Um, and that's because I try different things every time I play it. Um, it uh, it's meaty, it's got so much decision to it, while presenting you with very little decision. I think this is one of the things that Vita Lasada really excels in, is giving you some really solid decision, but without actually having too much to choose from. I, I suggest, have a look back at the gallerist, click on the link, it's a tight, meaty, decision-filled game, beautiful artwork, beautiful board, uh, massive board, heaps going on, it's got a good table presence to it. Um, oh, look, I just love this game so, so much. The Gallerist, that's my number two game for the year, and you've most likely guessed it a long time ago, my number one game, because I won't shut up about it, is another Vita Lasada, Lisboa. That's the new one this year. It only came out um, a few months back, in 2017. This, I think, is my, well, it is my number one game of the year. I think it's my strongest game that I've got on my shelf at the moment with so much decision, but so little decision at the same time. In your turn, you're choosing one of four actions. Split those actions in two. If you choose one of these two actions, you need to go and choose one of another two actions. If you choose one of these two actions, the card that you're using to do it tells you what to do. So one of them, you've got a choice of one in three. The other one just does what's on the card. If you're choosing these two, you're, use, you're using resources. If you choose this this one, you're using money. If you're choosing this one, you're using influence to be able to do it. And then 
on these two, once you make that decision to use your resource, you're either getting money in or you're doing some other stuff and you've got a choice of six things. And you can do two of those six things. So it narrows it down to a third of the things up that you're going to be able to do if you've got the resource to do it. There's so much decision going on. There's so many different ways past the victory on this game. I play this a lot, we play this a lot. This is the game that is my wife's number one as well as my number one. It is the go-to game. It is not a short game. It will generally last for two hours, maybe three, if you're a little bit switched off and trying to focus on other stuff as well. But it plays up to four players. I wish to have a four-player game. If you watch my Game Explanation videos, you'll notice, and I need to point this out, you will notice there are mistakes in that Game Explanation. I did that early. Those mistakes were corrected by Vita Lasada. Thank you. Thank you for watching my video. <laughs> um, and I have gone through and I've put in as much of an edit as I've been able to to fix them up. Um, I've put little notes on there. I think they're in the form of a poll. So if you ever see in one of my videos, if you see a little dot at the top that looks like it's a poll, click on it because it's more than likely giving you some information uh, to correct something that was picked up since the video went live because YouTube has stopped you being able to just add notes into your video, unfortunately. So that's how I'm correcting my mistakes uh, if they've not been picked up before they actually went live. So there's a couple of errors I've done in that video. They've since been fixed. It's a much harder game <laughs> since I did those videos. Now that I play correctly, um, it's a tighter game. It's even harder. I really loved it with my mistakes. I, lo <laughs> I love the uh, meatiness of it even more now. So have a look at Lisboa. If you're umming and ahhing about Lisboa, I can't recommend this game enough. It is so good. So good. Get into it. Have a look at it. Look, that's my number one pick for the year. I don't know how I'm, I line up against everyone else's uh, top 10 list. This is not a top 10, as I said at the beginning. It's not a top 10 of which games were the best that published in 2017. There is one or two games that were published in 2017 on that list. Lisboa. But it is not a list of which games are best come out this year. They're the, this is a list of the games that I enjoyed the most out of my 600 plays this year. So I'm going to leave it there. I've spoken far too much about these games already. And you can look at back at my videos. Thank you for following me this year. Please, if you're not following me yet, subscribe to my videos so you can keep track of what's happening next year. I hope to do a similar one at this time next year. The other thing I've noticed, if you look at my Board Game Geek profile, the Game Splanner, by the way, uh, and you look at my ranking, my rating of the games, you will notice that for a majority, and this is something I've noticed this year, when I rate my games, the 1 to 10 scale on Board Game Geek, majority of mine sit rounded up from where the average is. I don't know if that means I like games just a little bit more than the average person, um, unless I don't like it, that is, in which case it's got a super low ranking on it. Um, so that's just something I've noticed as through this year of gaming. I hope that everything I'm saying uh, gives you some information about me, about my gaming experience, and I hope this helps you get a grasp of what I've been doing this year. If you have any comments or suggestions, if you agree with my list, if you disagree with my list horrendously, please comment below. Say you're an idiot because you left out Clank or something like that. Or say, yes, I totally agree, Lisboa is awesome. So, right below on the comments. If you have any games that you wish to be gamesplained, please shoot me an email at thegamesplainer at gmail.com. Follow me on Instagram or Twitter, or there's also a Facebook page, by the way, I haven't mentioned that. It exists, the Gamesplainer Facebook page, Facebook group. I think I just can't remember if it's a group or page. Look it up, find it. Join it, follow me. To keep up to date with the games that I'm gamesplaining, subscribe to my videos, and until next time, enjoy gaming.